computer. Okay, so um, today is going to be uh, lecture three. So before we start the material, are there any questions about course logistics or course material? No? Okay. So let's see where we are. Um, okay, so today we're going to um, continue with our discussion of encoding with gradients. Uh, get to the MRI signal equation and hopefully get the case space trajectories and total sequences. Okay. Uh, so just to review where we're at, we talked about the big magnet, which is polarization, and this is what we call the V0 field, right? Uh, we talked about the transmit RF field, which is the B1 field, right? Correct citation. And uh, we're going to spend most of our time today on gradient coils, which is encoding. Okay. Um, and remember, this is trying to introduce gradients in um, frequency or phase. Um, I think some people on the pre lecture quiz picked polarization. So it's not trying to create gradients in polarization, it's trying to create gradients in frequency or phase. All right. And then we'll get to integration at a later time. All right. So, so basically, today we're on the third part, which is encoding. Uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time on that because that is sort of essentially how we make our images. Okay, just to remind you. Um, let's see, this is not. Okay, so anyways, we're we're going to use these gradient fields and. Um, this is going to create a delta BZ field. Okay. So remember, this is the isocenter, which we talked about last time. And spins at the isocenter process at gamma times C naught. All right. And then when we turn on this gradient field, uh, the field here is stronger. So field spins here, remember, they process in proportional to the local magnetic field. So the Larmor frequency of these spins is higher, and the Larmor frequency of these spins is lower. Um, so let's do an example from the book. This is from 12.1 from Prints and Links. And uh, the problem is here, you're given a B field that varies as a function of Z, such that B of Z equals 1, point, 1 plus 0 0.5 Z. Uh, the magnetization persists around the Z axis. Assume at time t equals zero, all magnetization vectors have the same phase. At what time will the magnetization vector at Z equals one centimeter and that at Z equals zero have the same phase again, all right? Um, and then also you can use that time to calculate what will the phases be at z equals 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. Okay. Uh, so this is the problem we're thinking about. We've got, assuming this is the z-axis, right? And we're here at zero. And we also, at some other location, one centimeter away, all right? And then we turn on this gradient, right? So this, um, and then the overall B of the, B field is one plus 0 0.5 Z. Okay, so this is like your B naught field, right? That's the constant term, and this is the gradient term. Okay. Um, so in this case, you're told that um, you're not giving any units here, it varies as function of Z in centimeters. Oh, yeah, you are. Okay. So, um, so BZ here. B at zero is just equal to zero, is equal to one, right? And B at one is equal to 0 0.5. So it's 1.5, right? So that's how you would, so that's basically telling us that there's a difference in B field. Now, all we really care about is the difference in B field, right? Because that's gonna give us the net difference in the frequency, okay? So we don't actually care that the, the one we sort of, they both have that one in them. So all we care about is the difference. So the Delta B is 0 0.5 Tesla. All right. So it means that if I have two spins here, they, let's say I have a spin here that starts at, they both start off at T equals zero and they're in phase, right? Now we're in the rotating frame of reference. What does it spin do? Does it change its phase? No, in the rotating frame reference, we can just imagine that spin is, stat is just going to stay at zero phase. Okay. 
So all we know, and then this one is going to, relative to that one, it's in a higher field. So it's going to spin faster. It's going to have a relative precession. Okay. And the change, the relative frequency shift is just delta B equals gamma times delta B, right? Um, over two pi. Okay. So we know that this spin here is going to spin at a frequency that's delta F higher than the spin at isocenter. So basically, if it's going, if we know, so its relative frequency is delta F. So we know that one, for it to go one period, is just one over delta F, right? That's, if I'm spinning like one second faster than you, then uh, one cycle per second faster than you, then in one second, I'll go one cycle more than you do, right? So that's how you think about it. So we know that the time, the delta T is just one over delta F. And so that would be the time for it to go one cycle more, all right? So let's look at that. The second page gives you that. So we, we just, we just uh, say we have our delta F, we said that that's 0 0.5 T and sort of, sort of that's our delta B. And then our delta F, we just said is gamma over two pi times that delta B, which just gives us 21.825 megahertz if we plug in the values. So we said one cycle is just delta T equals one over delta F. In this case, it's 0 0.047 microseconds, okay? So what we've said is that's how long it takes for this spin. This spin is at zero, stay static. This spin here has gone all the way around one cycle in that time, okay? So that's sort of reminding us that when we have these gradients, spins have accumulate different phase. Um, now you could go through the calculations to figure out the phases of the other ones, but if this is at one centimeter and this is 0 0.5 centimeters and this is at 0 0.25, so 0 0.75, into linear gradient, you can just by inspection say, well, if the one at one centimeter went one cycle, how far would the one at half a centimeter go? Right, it's got half the field strength difference, so it's only going to go half a cycle, right? So I could draw it like this. The one at 0 0.25 is only one quarter of the distance of the one at the centimeter, so its its delta f is only a quarter of that, so it's only going to go a quarter of a cycle. And similarly, the one at 0 0.75 um, is three quarters of the delta f, so it's going to go here. So in general, you can sort of, if you know what one cycle is, then you know that between those endpoints, you can just draw in where the circle, where the phase would have been. Okay. So that'll be helpful as we're doing some of the problem sets and examples. Just, you can you can do the calculations, but in general, the problems in this class are set up so you should look at it and you should be able to figure it out. Okay, And that gives you, what we want to do is help develop some physical intuition so that because otherwise with math, you, you have no idea if your answer is right or wrong. You make a mistake, you know, you could get an, an answer that's nonsensical, but if you can look at it and go, okay, well, that makes sense, then you can check your answer. So any questions on that example? Okay, so just to remind you, we went over this example last time in class. And as I said before, if we were uh, pre-COVID, we would do this in person and sort of have spins be people and people be spins. Um, but this is sort of like a plan view looking down on, and we had the people, like we imagined the spins as people spinning around. And here, the main point was in the presence of gradient, where depending on where you are, you would accumulate different phase. Okay. And we said, well, that's sort of interesting because if we look at the period here, this is a period of four delta X, right? So we could say that it's at some KX of, one over four delta x, that's its spatial frequency. If I let the spins keep processing, then now the period is two delta x, right? So now I'm at a higher spatial frequency, right? Because the period is smaller, so the frequency is higher. So the more rapidly things change, the higher the spatial frequency is. Now in this example, which I'm going to get to you in a moment, why this isn't actually not true. That sorry, there's a little arrow on this guy. He's missing. Here, the period is back to four delta x. Okay, and it turns out that that's sort of 
for the purpose of our example, that's okay, but it's actually not what actually happens because we've, we've only sampled it at certain locations, okay? So what I want to do today is just as a preview of coming attractions, sort of go through what's actually happening, you know, uh, in this uh, example. So, uh, but before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of the interpretation that each one of these, these orientation or arrangement of phasers corresponds to a certain location in K-space. Okay, so today we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about K-space, how to look at it, and then how to use that to make our uh, MR image. So the most important thing to remember is, or one of the most important things to remember is what is K equals zero? That means you're at zero spatial frequency. So that means nothing varies with space, okay? So in this case, the phase does not vary with space. Uh, the next thing is we could assume Kx with this frequency. So this means its period is eight delta X, right? And if we look at here, half a period is four delta X. And so that makes sense. One period would be eight delta X. And then if we went out to here, now the period is one over four delta X. So the period should be four. So the spatial frequency is one over four delta X. So this period is actually four, right? Going from here to here. Um, so the idea is for every sort of periodic arrangement of phases, we can assign to it this complex exponential, okay? Where the complex exponential, this term gives you the spatial frequency, and then this is the x-coordinate. Right? So that's sort of what we'll be working with for our Fourier transform. Um, so let's go back to this example now, because I want to go over an important point just so um, we, we sort of paired up. So the idea is that, you know, I've sort of had the spacing between spins, right? I've sort of said, this is my Delta X. And in general, when we do imaging, we have to declare a resolution. But remember our underlying object we assume is at microscopic scale, right? I mean, if we use a millimeter as our resolution, well, but underlying, you know, things are changing at nanometers or atom level things. And so we could keep increasing the resolution farther and farther down till you get to you know really advanced physics and you get to individual spins. We're not going to do this in this class, but we want to start thinking about, you know, um, at, later on we're going to have to make decisions about what resolution do we want to actually acquire. Okay. So anytime you do imaging, you have to sort of say, I want to acquire a certain resolution. Okay. Because resolution, as we'll find out, costs time and time costs money. And time is also in the clinical environment can be whether you live or die, okay? So if something takes too long, the patient might already be dead, okay? So uh, we're going to sort of always keep in mind that although we state things are at a certain resolution, the underlying object uh, we assume sort of is continuous, okay? So even though, so here I've said this is Kx equals zero, right? There's no spatial variation of the spins. And now I'm just saying, well, what if I filled in, and these arrows just fill in locations that I'm missing, okay? So there's actually underlying spins everywhere here. And so I can imagine filling in these spaces, like, well, you know, if I went to double, if I have my resolution, then I would also pick up these spins here, right? And they, at kx equals zero, they'd all still be pointing in the same direction. Here we said this was kx equals, what was this? One over four delta x. Right. And so that's that period from here to here, right? And that means if I filled in the missing spins, they would sort of follow that period. So going from here to here, you sort of see that the, that the spins are just rotating around. Okay. So just by inspection, I can draw where the spin should be because this one is halfway between these two spins, this one's halfway between these two spins. And so so this is still at that same period. And this one we said was kx equals one over two delta x, right? Because this is its period, right? And then we can fill in, imagine what would be consistent with those spins. And so the missing spins would follow these phases because between this and this, it's here. And between this and this, it's here, okay? So the idea is underlying our object, there's a continuous variation of phases, okay? Now, when we draw it, obviously we, can, we sample it but to keep in mind that there is this underlying thing. And where that comes in is previously, we said that this had a period of one over four delta X, okay? 
but that actually turned out not to be true. Okay, that was only true because when we sampled it like this, it looked like that. Okay, that looked like that was the period. So if we actually look at the missing spins, we can see here that between here, this spin and this spin, it must have gone through here, right? It had to go through there. So in fact, the missing there are missing spins here and here. And so this period is actually uh, has a period of three, four thirds delta x. Okay. And similarly, if we go to the next one, it's actually the missing spins are here. So this previously we said we said was kx equals zero, right? Because it looked like there was no variation at what we were sampling at. And so um, this turns out not to be true. It actually turned out that this period is one because these missing spins here are sort of anti parallel So in fact, the period now is one. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out because um, what this will get to is uh, the following thing. In the process of a constant gradient, the thing is spins will process at different frequencies, okay? So each spin will process at a different frequency depending on its location. Okay. And that means that if we look at any time point and we look at the spatial variation of phases, there's gonna be different sort of spatial variation of the phases. Um, and if we leave that gradient on, those spins will get more and more out of phase and they'll go to the spacing between those, uh, the spatial variation will become finer and finer and finer. Okay. And so that we're going, going to be going out in spatial frequency, which is, of course wants to go out in case space. And so essentially this gradient allows us to implement the complex exponential e to the minus j two pi kxx. Right. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Right. This is sort of new. So, I mean, if you have questions, that's that would be, Totally normal, but let me see nothing in the chat. Yes, questions. Yes, go ahead. Oh, the period because going from here to here is four thirds. Yeah, this spacing here is four thirds. Yeah, if you think about it this way, these we're increasing by one over four delta x. So this kx. If we go one fourth, one half, this would be three fourths delta x. And this would be, uh, sorry, so it's okay. Is it better? Can you figure out how to use my eraser here? Where is that? Here? Whoops, that's not what I want to do. Okay, here's the eraser. So let me erase this. Go back to the pen. Okay, so um, this would be kx equals three over four delta x. Okay, because I'm just going I'm going by delta k's multiples of one over four delta x, and this would be kx equals four over four delta x. Okay. Okay, so. Um, We'll have a chance to revisit that later, but I just wanted to give you a preview now. So what now we're gonna spend some time relating that to the Fourier transform. Um, so some of this will go through fairly rapidly. Um, there's an extended version of this in the supplementary video, or those of you who went to the session, we would have recovered a lot of this. Um, so just to remind you, the Fourier transform, we will be focusing mostly on 2D Fourier transforms, um, at least for the imaging. Uh, you can do 3D imaging, and, and that is very popular in MRI, but to keep things simple, we're going to focus on 2D imaging. Okay. So reminder that if I have an object GXY, its Fourier transform is defined like this. I take my object and I multiply it by this complex exponential, and then I integrate. Okay. So what we're doing today is this part here, or at least the encoding part is this, taking my object and multiplying it by this complex exponential. Okay, that's the encoding part, All right? The integration part comes later, okay? That's what the RF coil does. So the gradients do this part here. Okay. And it's inverse Fourier transfer. So we collect our data here. So this is the data that actually comes off the scanner. 
Okay, you're actually getting samples of GKXKY, right? Um, so in fact, if your object was like a rect function and you looked at the signal coming off the scanner, it'd be like a sync function. Okay. Then we take that data and we plug it into MATLAB or Python or some C code, and we do the inverse Fourier transform to get our object back. So we want to review a little bit about image space. So this is, we assume our underlying object is some function x, y, but we're acquiring our data in case space. So we want to review a little bit about how we think about case space, because most people don't really think about things in terms of case space. Okay? So we want to review a little bit about how to think about case space, you had a little bit of this on your uh, homework assignment where you sort of did Fourier transforms and we'll, so hopefully this will be somewhat of review and, and if there's any questions that came out of that homework, you know, certainly bring them up now. We can sort of make sure you understand what's going on. So the first thing we want to review is, you know, we want to apply Euler's theorem to this two-dimensional, uh, th this 2D complex exponential and just write it as a cosine plus a J sine term. Okay. So let's consider just this cosine term. All right. So if I have only the kx term, let's say ky equals zero, then my function is only a function of x, right? So it's only going to vary in x. Okay. And its period is going to be one over kx. Okay. Similarly, if I'm along the kx equals zero axis, so the vertical axis in k space, then my function is only a function of y, right? And the spatial um, period is one over ky. Now I could be at some arbitrary location, kx, ky, right? And so in that case, the spatial period is one over so the hypotenuse, kx squared plus ky squared. So just Pythagorean here. Okay. Um, a really important part of k space, um, I think this actually give you the solution for one of the homework problems, but whatever, it's good to do it on your own. Um, the center of k space is essentially just the area of your function, right? Because if I put in kx equals zero here, this is just one, so I just get the integral, okay? And that, so in 1D, it's the integral of a 1D function. In 2D, it's the integral of this 2D function. So that means, that's why when you look at, especially biological images, if you look at the Fourier transform, so in that homework assignment, you saw the Fourier transform was really strong and near the middle, right? And then fell off, right? That's because the average, intensity is sort of the biggest term, right? And then uh, on top of that's all the little details, but that that center of case space typically is gonna be the strongest for most biological images. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about case space. Um, so this is Kx, Ky, right? And remember if we're along, if Ky, Ky equals zero along this axis, right? So if I, the waves that I'm representing are waves that are only propagating in the X direction, right? So this is in the X direction now. So I'm just sort of de demonstrating what, so this, if I have energy or some component here at this point in case space, it would correspond to something in image space that's like a wave along the X direction. And if I move farther out into case space, then that's gonna be a wave along X direction but it's just got a higher frequency. Okay. Similarly, if I go here along the ky axis, this only has dependence on y, right? So this is only going to be a wave moving along the y direction. And if I go farther out into k space, uh, it's even higher frequency. Okay. And then if I go off diagonal, then I've got a diagonal pattern. And the, the easy thing to remember is if I give you a point in case space like that, and you wanna know what pattern it goes to, you simply go from the origin and draw an arrow to it, and then just draw the perpendiculars to that vector. And that will tell you what the pattern looks like in image space. Right? So that's an easy thing to remember. And the farther out that arrow goes, then the finer the pattern should be, right? Okay. Uh, so that's basically shown here. Um, so the spatial period is one over kx squared plus ky squared. So if I have some point out here in k space, you know, it would correspond to some spatial pattern like that, All right? Okay, so uh, just 
in the spirit of just reminding you about how to think about case space. Uh, typically, it's useful to think about sort of the inner part of case space and then sort of the outer parts of case space, sort of as the first level of you know understanding what's going on. So here, I'm just showing you. I've only what I'm going to be doing here is just I'm starting off with a Fourier transform where I'm only keeping the inner part of case space, so I can only represent very low frequency images, right? So if you look at the image that's reconstructed, it's very blurry, right? I mean, you could say it's a head, but it could be, I don't know, a donut or something. Who knows, right? It's something, right? So what you're going to see in this movie is, let's say I fill in more case space. Oh, did this movie work? Yeah. Okay. So now I filled in more case space, right? So now you can actually see, yeah, it is, it is a head and it's probably human, right? Uh, so that's good to know. And you can sort of even start seeing the cerebellum, the brain stem, the cortex, the corpus callosum, the nose, where the eyes, you know, the mouth, spinal cord, things like that, right? Okay, so, um, and the skull, okay? But it's got a lot of artifacts on it, right? You've got this ringing off the brain. You've got these, these I mean, do these layers actually exist in the brain or not, right? So you would like to know that, right? Like, um, so that means you've got to acquire more data. So essentially, center car part of case space gives you a pretty good low resolution approximation of what's going on. Okay, it's sort of like sometimes you know when you're on. Um, it's not exactly the same, but a lot of the image compression you have on the internet, you know, is typically wavelet or cosine based, and so it's typically you might see a low resolution. Like, like on YouTube, sometimes if you start a YouTube video, right, it's sort of low resolution. And then as time goes on, it gets better and better. It's exactly the same thing. They're starting off with a low frequency detail, sending you that. And then as your connection gets better and it can catch up, it starts sending the higher frequencies. Okay. Uh, and the good thing is that typically, especially with movement, when people move, you know, like if I move my arm, only this is changing. Like this is staying the same, right? So I don't want to have to transmit everything. I want to just transmit high frequency information here, but I can still use, you know, the, the low frequency high information here is really not changing. So this is also, the, the concepts here are also, you know, very useful for image compression and, you know, YouTube and things like that. Um, so now notice as I go farther, farther down case space, now I got an image and now you see all those artifacts have gone away. Right. So really, now you see these uh, gyri in the brain, the folds in the brain, and you're, you've, you've gotten rid of all of that layering in the brain. Okay. So those artifacts are gone. Yes, question. So like uh, we saw in CT that there was this sort of reconstruction filters that you used to increase the weight of high frequency data. Is there mm -hmm. anything similar for MRI or could we just take the inverse transform? Um, there is actually, uh, um, you can apply filters, so you can, but typically in MRI, um, you can sort of, uh, what, what is frequently done is um, you can either just not acquire that data in case space. So you could just acquire just data in the center. I mean, so if you want to go really fast, right? You might just acquire, so that's essentially you're doing an acquisition filter, right? But you can also filter the data afterwards and you can apply any filter you want actually. Um, and then for other things, it actually turns out you can make MRI look exactly like CT. You can actually go through case space and radial dimensions. <laughs> okay, so basically MRI, you can, as we'll see later, you can go through case space any way you want. Um, and, and then you can, then there's a lot of image processing, which we'll get into. Image reconstruction turned out to be a really fascinating area of MRI. And actually, that's where we're going to actually have to, um, you know, when, when we first started teaching this class nine years ago, there was no deep learning, right? And so it was just all Fourier based. So we're going to start off with the Fourier based, but just to give you an impression of where we're going, we're going to have to go back to some linear algebra layer so that you can understand why deep learning works. Okay. Because especially for the next, for, from now on, you know, to do medical deep learning is here to stay, basically. How much it overtakes Fourier. You still, I think, at least for now, I think you still need to know Fourier to have a good intuition, but uh, certainly um, computers turn out to just be much better <laughs> at this than even the smartest humans. <laughs> okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Probably too much, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's just play this movie just so you can, oh, sorry, get the sense of it. 
in real time. So just sort of get a sense of how that image sort of gets better and better as you incorporate more parts of case space. So the questions that we'll try to answer later is how much of case space do you want to acquire, right? What's good enough, right? Because it takes time to acquire case space. So you don't want to go, you could go infinitely out in case space, but then it's the same thing with CT, you're just acquiring noise. So at some point you have to say, this is good enough. Okay, so here's some examples. This is, um, I think this is actually what you did in your homework, right? So we can go through this very quickly. This is the head, this is a Fourier transform. If I zero out these parts of case space, then I'm really losing the components that are sort of like this, right? Because these parts of case space correspond to spatial components in that direction. So if I zoom in on this, for example, you notice that this edge here is quite blurry now, okay? I, I've lost information about that edge. And this the area of the corpus callosum, I'm really losing that information. Whereas this edge here going, the vertex the sort of going this way, that edge that I cross is still very sharp. Okay, so I've got, I'm still re maintaining information about edges like that, but I've lost information about edges like that. Okay. Whereas in the original image, you can sort of see, I had really nice detail. Okay. So this corp, the cerebellum here, it's sort of, sort of what is your little brain, okay? Um, and, and it's got some amazing folds. And yeah, it's sort of interesting. This, this, the, the mapping of this was only done fully a couple of years ago by a professor at San Diego State who used to be here at UCSD. So even just our understanding of what these structures look like is, is very current uh, science, right? Um, and then the other thing um, we talked a little bit about is actually sometimes in MRI, you actually get an image like this. Okay. And, and so the question is, okay, obviously I don't think my brain looks like that, okay? So this means, so we can ask ourselves, well, what happened in case space such that it gave me something like this, right? So we know it's, it's some, somehow there's some artifact that's given me stripes like that, right? So we know it's gotta be on somewhere along this axis that there was some extra energy just injected, some Fourier component injected that's giving me stripes like that. Okay. And this happens sometimes if like um, there's interference that gets into the room, you know, if there's the shielding is not good, there can be a burst of energy that just happens as you're going through case space, just happens to happen here. Or else there can be, even if, if things, little pieces of metal just vibrating and contacting each other, it's enough to give energy that is picked up. So the nice thing is now that you've taken this course, if you get an MRI and, and there's an artifact in your image, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what happened in case space. Okay. So similarly here, this is something that has this pattern. And, and in fact, if we draw an arrow to this component here, that's that pattern there, right? Okay. Um, so that's sort of a, a good sort of mental picture to have about case space. Um, to keep things simple, we've only really started talking about these stripes, right? Because that's sort of easy to draw. But in fact, in MR, we've actually got this. Right, we've got the phases of spins and how they're oriented and what sort of patterns they can take. And just to show you that basically this is sort of, if you look at this, this does have a diagonal pattern, right? If you look at where the spins have essentially the same phase, they do, does follow a diagonal. Okay. So this is sort of what we think of as an image, but underlying this is a spatial pattern of the spins. Okay. Um, and here's just another, image that would be well represented by this stretchy pattern. Okay. So just now that we've got that underlying image of the phases, let's let's talk a little bit about what that means. So here's a spatial pattern of the spins where there's no variation in X, Y, or any direction, right? Okay, so we call that the center K space. KX equals zero, KY equals zero, all right? No spatial variation in any direction. Here, if you look along the X direction, any row, there's no spatial variation, right? So you're trying to figure out where you're in K space, look along the rows and then look along the columns. Okay. So here, there's no variation along X, so therefore KX must be equal to zero, right? There is spatial variation along Y, so obviously KY is not equal to zero. 
Okay, so let's take a look at some spatial patterns. Um, once again, this is a sample, you know, it's a five by five matrix of just showing images. And um, here we're at the center of K space, right? K equals zero, KY equals zero. And then here, I'm arguing that we're at K equal, KX equals 0 0.25, KY equals 0 0.5. So let's actually see if that's the case. Kx equals 0 0.25 means the period is what? Four, right? So let's see if that's the case. So if I move along here, this is pointing in this direction. So I have to go four units over until it's pointing in the same direction again, right? So that period makes sense. Uh, if Ky equals 0 0.5, what is the period in the y direction? Right, and so if I go along any column from here to here is one period. So that's a period of two. In fact, it doesn't matter which column I pick, right? It's always a period of two, right? Okay. Similarly here, we have Kx equals minus 0.25. And the period here is four. And here's where we see what's different here. This is pointing down where this is pointing up. Okay, so that's that orientation of the rotation that we talked about. And so these are similar, except that orientation is different. And then here we have the same periods here. So it's still a period of four, but now KY equals zero. So basically there's no variation along the Y direction. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna sort of take, um, we've talked a little, so, so far we've really talked about this part. Right. These are the phaser patterns. Each of those patterns of arrows and things pointing different direction. That's my um, uh, essentially that that that's that's my complex exponential. The phaser pattern. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. In the third, uh, the right corner, can this also say that k um kx equals three no, four the, the one was, uh, this one yeah instead of negative one two five if you do it like clockwise oh um you mean does it go around yeah like three four three four three four yeah um for this example no because um if if, it, if the period really is minus 0. 0.25 then the spacing is the period is four Right, or three, if it was three fourths, the spacing would be four thirds, right? So, How do you decide which direction you want to do? oh, okay, so that's a good question. So, um, that basically is based on the definition of if we have e to the minus j two pi kx x, right? So, let's just do a simple example because this is this is a good question. So, remember, this just has the form e to the j theta, right? Okay, so by definition, if we have a phaser like that, theta is just equal to minus two pi kx x, right? So if kx equals zero, let's say kx is positive, right? Then my theta is gonna be negative as a function of x. So it's gonna rotate, if I think about the phaser as a function of x, they're gonna rotate like this, right? If kx is negative, then that's gonna be positive angles. It's gonna rotate like that. So by seeing how things rotate as you're going along the x direction, you can tell whether it's positive or negative frequency. Similar to the MATLAB assignment that I think was on homework five, four, I forget. Yes. This one? The one with the, yes. When kx equals negative, is that just rotate clockwise? Counterclockwise here. So see how that's going from here to here is counterclockwise rotation? Yeah, so that's that's positive, right? So theta equals minus two pi kx x. Kx is negative, so minus two pi kx x is positive as I move. Yes, by definition, theta is positive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, so so far, basically, this term here is our phaser pattern. Okay, that's that spatial pattern of phasers. And now we need to talk about 
the multiplication. Like how do I actually take my object and multiply it by a phaser pattern? Right. I can't just do it in MATLAB, right? I mean, I could do it in MATLAB, but and when you simulate it, you would do it in MATLAB. But in MRI, it's actually just the gradients essentially imprint that pattern onto your object. Okay, if I have some object here, you know, it has some spin, it has some material here, it has some material here, maybe it has no material here. So basically, the phases, the phaser pattern is sort of what the phase would be if the spins were there. Okay. So that multiplication is done for you implicitly, because basically where there is an object, it has it puts a phase on it, and where there is no object, you know, it's just you know, let's say there's zero object, then there's no spins there, right? So the density of spins essentially gives you the, the multiplication. Okay. So um, that multiplication is sort of done for you implicitly. We'll look at some examples of that in a minute, um, just to sort of get that through. So this is just to say that. You know, I have an object, and mathematically, I multiply it by some phaser pattern, and then I'll integrate over the whole thing. Okay. And similarly, if I have some other Fourier component, I do the same thing. Now, that was with very simple representations. In fact, I will have some phaser pattern that I'm going to imprint on my object. And here, at this point in case space, I have a different phaser pattern. So here, the phaser pattern, you notice, only varies in the x direction, right? Here, it only varies in the y direction. Okay? And essentially, what I want to do is make it so that the spins here carry the density multiplied by this phaser pattern. Okay, so how's that actually done? Well, there is no multiplication. It's just whenever you impose the gradients on, that multiplication is done for you. But let's look at an example to try to get that across and, and sort of give you some more intuition into what, what, what's going on. So imagine this is like, um, I don't know, let's say this is like a big piece of cake, right? Okay. With some water hydrogen protons in it, right? It's something that I can image in an MR scanner. And I am at some place where I impose this phas phaser pattern on it, right? So there's spins everywhere. And so everywhere there's a spin, it's going to get a far some phase. And then I just, my coil sees the magnitude, the spins from all those, sees the signal from all those. So it just sums it up. That's the integration. Now, this object here, you know, is like this long bar. So it's really not very well represented by diagonals, right? So if you look at it, if I think about summing up all the contributions from these vectors, like any to where I have a vector that's pointing in this direction, I can find a vector that's sort of pointing in the opposite direction. Right. So you can imagine summing up all these vectors, the overall vector sum is going to be pretty small. Okay. So that means when I'm going through my MRI thing, the, the amplitude of the signal I get at that point in case space is going to be pretty small. It's basically saying there's not really not much of your image that's represented by a diagonal pattern. Now let's say I go and I'm really fancy and I decide to cut out diagonal stripes out of my cake. So now essentially I have cake, nothing, cake, nothing in a diagonal pattern, right? So that's shown here, right? Essentially there's only cake here, right? And here there's no cake, right? Or you ate, you ate the cake, okay? Um, so here where there is cake, I still have my spins and where there's no cake, I have no spins. So that's essentially multiplying my spatial pattern by zero here, right? And zero here and zero here. Okay, so that's how the multiplication is done. So now if you look at it, this cake here is diagonal, or it's got a diagonal structure to it. And therefore, for every spin here that's pointing in this direction, there's really not much, there's really not a spin that's pointing in the opposite direction. Okay. So because this pattern matches my object, when I sum up all these vectors, I get a pretty big signal. So if I was on the MRI machine, at that point in case space, the signal amplitude would go up. And that means, hey, this object has a lot of variation at that frequency and that orientation. Okay. And so the integration of the signal is basically done by the coil. So uh, for example, most every MRI, you know, most whole body systems will always come with what's called the body coil which can both transmit and then it can also receive the signal from the entire body. But as we showed before in uh, lecture one, you can also have a smaller coil that only integrate over a smaller area. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about why you would do that in a, in a later lecture. Okay, so here's a recipe for the 2D Fourier transform. Uh, for each case space location, create a spatially varying phasor pattern. All right, so basically we apply the gradients and we wait till the pattern is what we want. And we're like, oh, great, now we have the pattern we want. Um, then we think about the multiplication of the object by the phasor pattern to obtain this product, GXY, this. This is just done for us, right? There's nothing we have to do. Once we apply the gradient, essentially, so the gradient is applied to the object. That's essentially multiplying, doing the multiplication for us. And then we integrate the product over all of space. Okay. And steps one and two are what we consider the encoding steps. And then step three is the integration. Okay, so let's do, um, let's see where we headed. Okay, so what we're gonna do for the rest of today's lecture is we're going to uh, dive a little deeper into this concept. Um, and so what I have here is a movie that, there's a version of this in Canvas. So you can take a look at this on Canvas is, um, this is an object where it's zero here, right? And it's one here. Okay. So black is zero and white is one. So obviously this has a stripey pattern this way. So we would expect that um, uh, it's gonna be well matched by phasor patterns that have spatial pattern that uh, is like a KY component. And it's not gonna be very well matched by spatial patterns in any other component. So let's take a look at this. So here, uh, I know it's a little hard to see, but let's think we zoom in on, even though, sorry. It'll be better if you, you can play this movie on your own, um, but essentially, there's lots of little tiny arrows here that they're all pointing in the same direction. So it starts off at kx equals zero, okay? So this is my object. And if I imagine multiplying my object by this phasor pattern, this is what I get, right? Zero times these phasors is just giving me zero, right? Zero here and zero here. So I only have contribution from the spins here and the spins here, okay? If these spins are all pointing in the same direction, then they will add up to give me something because this object has an average intensity, right? It's not, it, it's it's still, the, remember the center of K space is gonna give me my average signal. And so this object still has an average signal. Uh, so this is a movie. So what we can do is, is we play the movie, let me just play it. So, what, so first look at this and I'm gonna play the movie again. Just notice how we're going through K space here. So, I'm, so as, as you see, we're going through case space. I'm starting to impose patterns vertically, and then I start adding patterns horizontally so that the overall, at the end, I've got, end up with a diagonal pattern, okay? So now we're gonna go through a little slower. So, and this is the vector sum. So notice, watch what happens to this vector sum as I go through different patterns of case space. See there, it went, to zero, right? Because if you look at this pattern here, um, let's see, this frequency pattern isn't really matching. It's got everything negative here is balanced out by a positive here, okay? Um, so I think this is at a spatial frequency of, like this is a one period, okay? Of that spatial frequency. So something with this period, this, this period, this has a period of from here to here. So something with a bigger period makes it so that the spins all cancel out. Okay. I keep going. Ah, now I'm getting a pretty big number. Okay. So now this thing here is varying such that these spins here are pointing the same direction as these spins here. So when I get to here, it's all adding up. Okay. And then if you notice, I start adding some diagonal variations. Well, that's not a very good match for my object, right? So that this term stays fairly small. Okay. So essentially, as I went through the different spatial patterns, I had something pretty strong at the center case space, and then it sort of was here, and then it went up again when it matched, and then it went down again. Okay. So there were really two peaks in that, that Fourier transform. Okay, so let's do, let me see where we are. Okay. So let's do a few examples of this. So um, let's say this is my phasor pattern. And this is my object, which is all ones. So 
if I think about doing this, um, multiplying this by this, then I have spins everywhere, right? So this, this, um, these would all sum up to 25. Okay, so if I add, just add up these all together, it, the sum would be 25. Okay, so this, my object obviously has no spatial pattern. So this is actually a pretty good match for my object. Right. Now let's say I'm still at the center case space, but now my object is this one where it's um, it's got ones ones here and negative ones here and ones here. Okay. So let's think about what that would look like. Uh, let me change the color here. Get that color maybe. Yellow. Let's see what would be the color. Yellow would be the color. Yeah. So everywhere I have a one. Oops. That's not good. That's not what I wanted. Uh, let's try to erase that first. And let's try, I think orange would be good. Okay, let's go orange. Okay, so I, I still have these spins here, right? They're pointing in that direction, right? Where there's zero, there's zero spins, so there's no contribution. And then where's minus one, that minus one multiplies my spins, so it just turns them that way. Okay. And when I add up to all that, I get minus one. So basically, you know, this is a pretty straight the object. So it, it does, it sort of makes sense that the Fourier transform is going to be pretty small because it's not a really good match for at this location of kx equals zero, ky equals zero. Uh, let's look at this one here. So this is slightly different. So this is actually a different spatial pattern. So there's actually, it's got KX at some, it's got a period of four this way, right? A period of four this way. Okay. And if you look at this, this actually has a period of four this way and a period of four that way. So this should be a fairly good match for my object. So let's see if it is. So where it's one, I can just draw in what those things are. Right. And then the words minus one, wherever there's that phase, I have to multiply by minus one. So this multiplied by minus one just makes it go that way. So then I get this. Okay. So that vector sum is now minus 13. All right. And similarly, if this is my object now, so now this is an object that just ones and zeros. Now that just appeared here is two. And the period here is two, right? Okay. So whereas here the period was four, now the period is two. And look at this, the period of this is two and the period of this is two, right? So this should be a fairly good match for my object as well for this object, okay? So in fact, if I do that and I draw in where the spins are, I get a pretty big number of 13. So this is a good match for this object and this was a good match for this opportunity. We get sort of the same magnitude of the factor sum. Um, so this movie is just sort of just showing that my object here is uniform. I have things everywhere. So once again, we're gonna look at the summation of these vectors. And so it's pretty big here because at kx equals zero, that's a good match. And look at, as I change that thing, as I change to other vector patterns, the vector sum is always very small. Because none of those other patterns is a good match for my object. Whereas here, now I've made these zeros, right? So now I should find another location that's a good match for this object. And so let's see if we can find that. So that's a good match. That's not a good match. That's not a very good match. That's not a very good match. That's a pretty good match. Okay, okay so that's the basics. So now what we're going to do is if there's no more questions, we're going to actually have you do an in class exercise um, to sort of see uh, how well. Um, you understand this? So um, let's see, how are we gonna do this? Um,
Okay, so this is your object here. It's got one, zero, one. So it's sort of like this, it's a very simple object, right? Three by three. And this represents the spatial pattern. So the arrows represent the spatial pattern. Okay. Um, and then, but notice that even though I've drawn an arrow here, in fact, there'd be no spin here because it's zero. Okay. But I'm just showing you what the spatial pattern would be if there was a, if there was an object there. So what you're asked to do is for each of these A, B, C, D, and E, you're asked to figure out where in K space you are and also what's the vector sum. So let's do a couple examples together and then we'll have you do the, 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 these three on your own. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's look at this one. Where am I in Kx here? Is there any variation along the x direction? No, so my kx equals zero, right? How about ky? Same zero, okay. And what's the vector sum of this object? Five, right? Good. Okay. All right, let's look at this one. What's kx equal here? What's the period of this? Is there any variation in this direction? Yeah, and what's the period? Let's say let's say this is a unit of one, right? So this the period would be two. So kx would be plus or minus a half. We don't we really can't tell which way it's going, right? Because 180 is equal to minus 180, right? Okay. What about the ky direction? Zero, right? Good. And what's the sum here? Minus four, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, so there there is some variation. So the object has a period. Um, you know, the period of the x thing is at least matching my object, right? The variation in x is has a period of two, and my object has a period of two, right, in x direction. But it's not a very good match in the y direction, right? Because my object has a period of two, but my y variation has no my y kind of has no variation. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, which one should be minus two? Minus two. Oh, this should be minus three. Oh, four minus one. Yes, minus three. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Doing math is still important. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just keep doing it this way because I think it's actually fine to just do it together. So, uh, let's look at this one. What's kx equal to here? Yeah. Okay, and what about ky? So the period here is what? So the ky is what? Plus or minus a half, we're not really sure, right? And what's the vector sum here? Also minus three, good, okay. Okay, so now, so we should be able to do better than minus three, right? Because none of these patterns really match my object very well. Okay, so let's see if this does it. So what's the period here in Kx? What's Kx here? Yeah, it's either plus or minus a half. We're not really sure. What about Ky? Okay, and what's the vector sum? Five, good. So we've done better, right? Which makes sense because now this is a better match for my object, right? So the magnitude of the Fourier transform at that kx ky is bigger. Yes, question. Yeah, that's just saying that both of those are equally good match to my object because my object has both spatial variation and also has some net value. So that's that's all it's saying. Oh, well, this is a very weird object, right? So in general, if I put a body or a head in, the kx zero, ky equals zero is like really big, okay? Because if you, you imagine you, you start off with a human brain, which is like a blob, and then you add detail to it, and all the details are less than the overall blob. Okay. So yeah, this is, a, this is sort of just a very simple example 
just so we can do it. Obviously, anything more complicated, it would take forever to do it by hand. So that's a good question. All right, uh, let's do the last one. Um, what's KX for the last one? Sorry? Negative one four. Okay. So how did you decide it was negative? Okay, so we're going clockwise, right? So if we're going clockwise, let's let's remember what we said. We said theta was equal to minus two pi kx x, right? So if we go and remember clockwise is negative angles, right? As a as if kx is positive, and as we're going along x, then we will go clockwise, right? So in this case, I think kx would be plus one four, right? Now, how did you get the the four? Yeah, because here half a period is two, right? Yeah, okay. And what's ky here? Good. Okay. And what's the sum here? It's one. Yeah. That's sort of tricky, right? Because these are imaginary, right? But luckily they cancel out, so you don't have to worry about it. But if they didn't cancel out, you can actually, and here's the point, you actually can have imaginary numbers in your Fourier transform. In fact, your Fourier transform will be imaginary, okay? Or complex, sorry. And so that means that actually the numbers, uh, and we'll talk about that later, how we do that, but the numbers you actually get off the MRI scanner, you actually have to treat them as complex numbers, which is sort of weird, right? You, you always think of complex numbers, that's just like math, right? The cool thing about MRI is all that math is like, that's actually physics, right? So we're gonna talk later about what complex numbers mean that, what, as they're coming off the scanner, right? So not only is it doing a Fourier transform for you, but it's throwing off these complex numbers. Okay, um, there's a question, why is it positive again? So good question. So. Imagine this is the positive x direction, right? So going from um, going in the x direction, um, the the phases are going clockwise, right? So they're acquiring a negative angle. Okay. So remember, theta is equal. We have our we're assuming our terms are e to the minus j two pi kx x. Just just by definition, okay. We could have defined it with a plus, but just so the definition that people use for Fourier transform is e to the minus j two pi kx x. So that means if kx is positive, then that angle is negative as I move in the positive x direction. Okay. So, um, so that's that's how you think about it. And and sometimes for a lot of these things, it's actually even though you hear it in class, sometimes you just have to write it down for yourself. Okay. So I would just suggest sit down and just write it down and go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. All right, any questions before we move on? Okay, so now we're gonna start adding some sort of the mathematical sort of machinery to this so we can actually have our expression. Uh, and then hopefully uh, next time we'll talk a little bit about how we actually move the case space. So the mathematical notation is we say that our BZ field is our B naught field plus these gradient contributions. We've sort of gone through this already. Um, but the nice thing is we can define a vector uh, I, with I, J, K direction and a, a direction vector. This is my gradient vector. This is my position vector. So this whole thing here can be written as just G dot R, right? So if we don't have to want to keep writing all these terms, we can just do G dot R. So we say that the BZ is just equal to B naught plus G dot R. Okay. And here I've left the gradient as a function of time. So we're gonna find out that actually in MRI, one aspect of MRI is instead of having, you know, the detector rotate around, we actually vary the gradient amplitudes. So that's, that's the time varying part of MRI. If we're playing RF fields at different times and we're varying the gradients. Okay, so that's what's happening. And in terms of why MRI is noisy, that's the gradient. So we'll talk about it later. Okay. So this just reminds you that previously we had precession around a uniform field. So this is when B is equal to B naught. Okay, so no gradients, right? So in the presence of no gradients, everything just rotates at omega naught. Okay, just pre precession, uniform precession. 
now we start adding on the gradients. And so this gamma BZ term has our gamma B naught. So we still have that omega naught, right? So all the spins have that omega naught. But now we add a delta omega to each spin, depending on its location and where you are in time. <coughs> okay. So now what we want to do is talk about, oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize that this was still showing. Okay. Uh, the phase due to gradients. Okay. So, because what we'd like to do is we'd like to sort of, you know, we've been talking about phases a lot, right? So we want to be able to go between frequency and phase. Okay. So just to remind you that phase, that's the angle of our magnetization phaser. That's all those pictures we've drawn. We've been looking at the phase as a function of, of space, right? But what really is changing is we're not really, we're sort of changing the frequency of every spin, right? And then as it evolves, it takes on different phases. So we need something to relate phase and frequency. So it turns out that frequency is just the rate of change of the angle okay, in terms of radians per second. So that means if I take the derivative of my phase, that's my angular frequency. Okay. And similarly, if I know that's the case, then I can just say, well, my phase is gonna be the time integral of my frequency. Okay. And this would just be minus omega naught t plus some delta t. Okay. So this minus omega naught t, that's just the phase I get going around like that, right? And it's clockwise rotation, so we're just assuming it's just going like that. This delta t is sort of, the incremental phase, um, and since it's reference to omega naught, it's essentially the phase in my rotating frame. So this incremental phase is simply the, the time integral of my delta omega, okay? But I said my delta omega is just equal to my gamma times g dot r d tau. So this starts giving us some insight in the fact that, hey, my phase is directly related to the integral of my gradients. Okay. And it turns out the simple picture we'll get to is if I simply look at the area under my gradients, that's going to tell me where I am in phase space. Okay. okay, so let's take a look picture of that, what happens to a phase with constant gradient. So let's assume that these are my spins um, at different locations. Okay. Um, sorry, what is blanking out on what I was trying to show you. Let's see if I can go. Okay, so this, assume this is a spin at some location at the isocenter. So this is a spin at the isocenter. And this is a spin that's off isocenter. Okay, so over time, the spin at isocenter, as we've talked about a lot, this stays, has the same phase. Now, if we go off isocenter, then this gradient is on the whole time, right? So this is processing at a higher frequency. So it's going to acquire net. It's going to go faster. So at every point in time, I can sort of think about it's acquired some net phase. Okay? And in fact, the delta phase I acquire is just going to be minus gamma times gx x times, this is time t1. Uh, at this is at time t1, and then as I go on in time, this is at time t2, this is time t3. And so simply, basically, this product, my gradient times where I am in x, and then how long I've been. And so notice that the longer I have the gradient on, the more this phase accumulates, okay? Uh, but here's a really interesting example. What happens if I have my gradient on and then I turn it off and then turn it back on again? Okay. So from this period to this period, the gradient's on. So this spin here is processing faster than this spin. So it acquires some net phase, right? But now I turn the gradient off. So now from this time to this time, the spins are going at exactly the same rate. So if I go from here to here, no, there's no more net phase accumulated. So it's pretty cool. The spin is actually remembered where it was, okay? And so that's a really interesting aspect of MRI. So in fact, in this case, the integral from zero to, from this to this, since this is zero, it's the same as the integral from here to here. 
Now I turn the gradient back on. So now from this period to this period, they're out of phase again. So I accumulate a little more phase. So this turning on and off of the gradients is we do that a lot in MRI. Essentially, we go out to we can move spins out to a certain place in K space, and we turn the gradients off. They will stay at that place in K space. Okay, so um, building up the picture. So we have our magnetization. Uh, we we're talking here about the transfer magnetization. We're going to assume it's decaying with T two. And it's got some phase. Okay. So this is just saying that we can represent that phase term in terms of a part that is due to the main field, omega naught, and this term here, which is this integral of the delta omega. And we said that we could write this as the integral of g dot r d tau. Okay. So for example, if I just have the x rating on, that would just look zero t gx x. Um, uh, DT, right? And sort of looking at this, if X doesn't depend on tau, so we can actually extract that and I write that X zero T GX D tau. So this is basically the area of, of my gradient. So let's take a look at that here. Um, so now we're going to assume we're going to integrate this signal over a volume. Okay. Um, and so this is the term we had before. And we're simply going to integrate that over some volume. And one thing we're going to do to simplify things to do it in 2D is we're going to assume that we can just take a slice of my object. So if my object is like this, I'm going to assume I can just take a slice of my object with delta z. Okay. We're going to talk later in the course how we do that. That's called slice selection. So it turns out another part of MRI is in CT, you sort of get different slices by moving the object through and past the detector, right? In MRI, you can do that. But the other way you can do it is you can just say, use the gradient to say, I want to just excite magnetization here, or I want to excite magnetization here. So you can select which slice you want to Okay, without having to move the object at all. So we're going to assume we can do that. And so we do that. We're just going to go, our, our, our signal is just going to depend on the magnetization within some slice. So we're going to say that this is some MXY that we're imaging. Okay. So now just 2D imaging. And it's multiplied by this, con, this omega naught term, but this is the term we really care about. So we're just going to show you what that looks like, and then we'll go into more detail uh, next week on what this is. But we're going to sort of go a little deeper into this part just to show you that this is actually going to be the Fourier transform. Okay. So all we're doing here is I've just rewritten this. Now I'm going to break out this GX term. So this G dot R is a GX X plus G Y Y, right? And notice that the X and Y have no, are not a function of tau. So we can break that out such that, um, you know, for example, what I just said, GX, X, D tau, I can break it up into X times GX of tau. Okay. So that's what I've done here. I've defined, I've taken out the X and then the KX of T is essentially this integral gamma over two pi, the integral of gx of tau d tau from zero to t and ky of t equals gamma over two pi zero y dy tau d tau. So what this means is that my MRI signal as a function of time is simply my object times some complex exponential that has this form. It's basically the Fourier transform at kx of tau, kx of t, ky of t. So basically in MR, we use the gradients to move to control KX of T and KY of T. So at every point in time, we say, I'm at this place in KX of KY. And if I'm at that point, the signal I measure at that point is essentially a Fourier transform at that place in K space. And then I move to another point in K space and I do the measurement. That's the Fourier transform at another KX KY. Okay. 
And I do that over and over again until I have enough points in K space that I feel like I can reconstruct my image. So the bottom line is the MRI signal is the Fourier transform of your object. Uh, so basically, this here is just the Fourier transform at location kx at t, ky at t, or you can write as the Fourier transform of mxy at kx at t, ky at t. So, um, and the spatial frequencies are given by these formulas. So we've gone through sort of a lot of, uh, sort of gone through a lot of slides to get to that, but the main point that I want you to leave you with uh, is that this are, these are actually fairly simple expressions. Okay? Even though it's what we've done is quite complicated, at the end of the day, you're left with where you are in case space is simply gamma over two pi times the area under your gradient as a function of time. Okay? And that's and even though it's so simple, now figuring out how to control your gradients turns out to be fairly complicated. And there's many ways of doing it. Okay. So the, the, the equation is very simple, but it actually, there's like a zillion ways to do it. Okay. And that's a lot of MR engineering is what's the best way to go through case space? How should I play these gradients out? Okay. That becomes design. I mean, there are whole PhD thesis written about this. Or people And people have made their careers on designing better gradient trajectories or optimal trajectories. So that's what we'll end for today. Um, so next time we'll talk about some very simple ways of moving through case space, and then also give you an idea of what more complicated ways of moving through case space are. Uh, but if there's no other questions, we'll, we'll end now, um, since uh, I think it's close to time. Uh, and so I'll, the homework, the next homework will be posted later today. Um, and if you have any questions about today's lecture, just feel free to come up. Okay. Or homework.